uh, Chris, we need a business plan. I'm like, we have a business plan. It ain't working. We're going broke right now. And we don't have time to sit around and have a board of advisors or directors telling us more stuff that we could be doing and not doing anything. So I'd love for you to respond to that. Because the way that um, ADHD brains work as well, we have a lot of ideas. Ideas just keep coming. We want to do something with it. So we kind of create all these ideas and plans. And that's why in the creative industry as well, we can really, really thrive in some of those creative roles, but we can also really, really flounder because we don't have the executive function a lot of the time to go from the idea to the actual finished thing that's out in the world. As an ADHD person, do you find it difficult to be silent? Do you find it difficult just to listen versus I need to talk and tell you all my things right now? Um, yes. Hey, everybody. I know when we have guests who talk about neurodiversion ideas, people get really excited because they feel seen and heard. And so when Abby reached out to me, it's like, Chris, I have ADHD. I talk to people about ADHD and creativity. I was thinking this is a perfect opportunity. So Abby, welcome, welcome to the show and please introduce yourself and tell us a little story about who you are, what you do. Okay. Hi, Chris. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, so um, my name is Abby Lemon. I'm an ADHD coach for creatives. Um, I was a creative myself for many years. I worked in publishing magazine design and had had my own business as well um, and really felt the call after my own ADHD diagnosis to support other people in the creative industry because the more people I spoke to, either ex-colleagues or peers or people that have worked for me as freelancers, all seem to be experiencing a lot of the same symptoms of ADHD, the same signs as other neurodivergences as well. So it really feels like um, it really feels like it's something that is probably quite prolific across um, any kind of creative industry. I think with with our kind of super powered brains. Mm. So you mentioned that you were diagnosed. Uh, let me ask you the que this question, which is, yeah, what made you suspicious you might have an ADHD brain? And then what kind of tests did you take to make sure that you do have it? I guess I've always been um, fairly hyperactive a little bit. Um, I talk very fast. I've had an awful lot of um, experiences, I guess, that I always felt like I didn't fit in. I was There was even from a very early age, it was like this sense of not quite fitting in, not quite feeling like I was doing what other people were doing, this sense of feeling quite flaky and not finishing things and, and all of that stuff. So there, I always knew there was something, well, I thought there was something going on, but I thought it was just me being not fitting in and kind of being weird or any of, you know, all of that stuff. And um, so when I actually started a master's degree a couple of years ago, um, part of the master's program was you can be, talk to educational psychologists to see if there's anything like dyslexia or, um, and I thought, do you know what? I've been reading a lot about ADHD recently. I've been seeing people talking in the media about this kind of list of things like this you know, inattentiveness, this childhood stuff, this um, not fitting in, this kind of um, inability to focus and finish things off and all of this. And I thought, do you know what? It sounds, it really sounds like me. So off I went for this educational psychology um, assessment for ADHD and lo and behold, it was, you know, a pretty much high on the scale for everything. Um, and it just felt like suddenly the jigs, the final little jigsaw piece slipped into place for me because rather than feeling like someone who was just not humaning properly and not being able to kind of, um, do things in the same way or finish things in the same way as the people. Suddenly it was like, oh my God, there might actually be a reason for that. Um, and that's, the reason isn't that I'm a terrible human. It's there's something else going on. Mm. So I have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, how were you as a student yeah. throughout grade school and then through college? From an early age, I was told I was a daydreamer. I was told I was highly intelligent, but didn't try very hard. And I was lazy and I could always do better. Um, I would talk too much. I didn't pay attention. Um, I found it very hard to finish things. So when I left high school, I went to college for a few months. Then I went off traveling for a bit. Then I came back to college. Then I left that again and did something else. And so there was always this sense of, I can't finish something. I don't, I'm, I'm just felt like I was told I was not good enough. I was lazy, you know, constantly my school reports were could dry harder, could do better. It's clever, but doesn't apply herself. So I kind of left education feeling um, really like, you know, quite a low self-esteem, I guess, underneath the kind of the um, 
a supposedly outgoing nature was this this feeling that everyone just kept telling me I wasn't good enough and and I could do better even when I was trying really hard. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was it was an interesting time I think that kind of led up to the very volatile teenage years. Coming out of that feeling really not very good and and like I didn't really know who I was and and all of that stuff. Mm. What you're telling me is quite fascinating because I'm probably the opposite to you in the spectrum. Um, but the same kinds of comments and critiques that you got as a child, I got too. Like intelligent, doesn't yeah. really apply himself, um, could do better. Uh, that sounds just like a normal Asian parent talking right there, you know, because no matter how well your kid's doing, they could always be doing better. Now, I struggled through school because the topics didn't interest me. I felt like I was mm -hmm. smarter than the other students. And I was just sitting there, kind of just half my brain at work and still doing a level work. And so I wasn't really engaged. And there were only a couple of classes or professors and instructors who really engaged in conversation with me where I'm like, oh, I, I'd like to participate now, but I have no problems with focus and attention. Actually, I tell people I'm, I'm, a, I'm a notorious single tasker. I can do one thing well, and then I don't want to do anything else. And I'll stay there until I'm done. And, and for some people that might be as crazy as you bouncing from topic to topic. And we both have then shared outcome, which is some kind of esteem issues. Like, am I lazy? Am I just bored in school? You know, I think if I had gone to different school that were designed for people uh, to to be more tailored towards the, the kids in class versus teaching to the average, I would have probably been a lot more engaged because I had no problem once I got into college. Yeah. And I think with, um, especially well in the UK where I grew up, especially amongst girls and, and females, ADHD wasn't recognized because it shows up differently um, than it does in boys. You know, it's and and your that your superpower of being able to focus on one thing until it's finished, honestly, that's that blows my absolute <laughs> mind because I literally cannot do that. <laughs> I need at least 17 different projects going on at once that are like spinning around up here. Um and I and and, I, and that's yeah, that's just how my brain works. But sort of back to the girls thing, I think um I think ADHD as a kid when I was growing up in the 1980s was boys that were naughty, boys that ran around and were hyperactive and boys that bounced off the walls and were, you know, excluded from school for being like, you know, not paying attention and all this stuff. And so, and as, as someone who is quite intelligent and, and also quite creative, I've found ways of hiding how I actually felt underneath I think because it wasn't you know recognized as being anything other than me just not paying attention or not being lazy you learn to sort of paddle furiously underneath the water you know like the kind of um the metaphorical swan or whatever where everybody thinks oh you know they're doing okay even though we keep telling them they're not good enough you kind of keep paddling and paddling like 800 times harder just to stay afloat um and I think many women now are coming out of this, you know, coming into perimenopause stage, which, which, you know, coming into a certain point where hormones are changing. And actually this whole lifetime of trying to be somebody else and be, live up to the expectation, much like you're saying about your parents, but living up to the expectation of what everybody thinks you should be doing, it kind of comes crumbling down a little bit, which I think is why so many later in life diagnoses are happening at, at the moment um, mm. within kind of other women and um uh, it's and stuff. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of other questions to ask you, but when you had mentioned, then finally you got diagnosed as you're pursuing your master's degree. Yeah. Um, what uh, just, if you can just briefly tell me if you didn't love the entire school experience and you bounced in and out of school until you finished, what compelled you to get more of the punishment? I'm just curious. Oh, okay. Um, because I guess in true ADHD style, I decided that I really wanted to pivot my business into the kind of psychology side of the work I was doing. I was doing a lot of mentoring and coaching. Um, and for the master's degree, what I did was just go absolutely crazy into positive psychology, hy the hyper focus, learning about it. And the uh, for, for me with ADHD, so something that I'm very impulsive about is when I'm really interested in something, I have this amazing drive to suddenly learn everything about it and be essentially qualified to the top level that I could possibly be in it. Um, so I guess it is almost like a little bit of, um, I don't know, a glutton for punishment, but also, uh, you know, when it felt like, actually, I'm going to do this. And because I did finish my bachelor's degree, I actually proved to myself at that point beforehand that I can do it if I if I want to. I might hate it and I might absolutely be like, this is like the most lowest 
dopamine inducing thing ever, but I can finish stuff. So I think to to go back to it, it's just like this this drive that I have within me, and I know a lot of other ADHDs are the same too. When you're interested in something, you are so, so interested. Yes, you, you're interested in loads of other stuff as well, but the, the hyper-focus thing is is really real. And I think riding that that kind of hyper-focus wave is, um, yeah, I think I'm, maybe I'm just impulsive and I just think I'm going to do that and then sign up for it and then worry about it later. So maybe there's an element of that as well. <laughs> you, you do remind me a little bit of my wife in some regards here. So I'm like, oh, uh, there might be a connection here. But I, I think there are parallels, again, <laughs> So this is, uh, I want to get into the nuance of this because I think a lot of times when people uh, attach these kinds of labels, people just automatically assume it's going to be so different or a certain way. And what I find quite interesting is I'm also a deep diver. And so when I find something I'm interested in, I go really deep. I guess the difference, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the a difference between a person like me and you is when I go deep, I go deep for like three years. I don't go deep for like three weeks or three months. And it annoys people like, how, when are you going to quit on this? Like, why would I quit? I'm, I want to go to the very terminal point of which it is that I want to explore this passion or this interest. And where I say you remind me of my wife, she's hot and cold depending on w w what time of day it is. And it's like, oh, I'm really into this. And I'm like, oh, then now you're into this. And so after a while, I've just learned to just step back, let her go through her pace and not like try to ride every wave with her. Because for a person like myself, mm -hmm. it's exhausting. Like, oh, it's all about this. And then, no, no, it's about this philosopher now. And then it's about this religion. And it's just, it's all over the place. But I love how she explores things so deeply. But it's mm -hmm. it's like um, that line from Blade Runner, the candle that burns twice yeah. as bright burns twice as fast. Yeah, it's exhausting for us as well. When we're in, <laughs> we are, you know, there's always a running kind of joke around ADHD is that we have this like graveyard in our loft of all the hobbies and interests that we've kind of loved for three or four months or six, as you know, and then kind of put away for, you know, the future where we're never going to look at it ever again because something new will take its place. It's also energizing and brilliant, but it is exhausting because our brains tend to be going at this kind of Ferrari pace um, with like a set of like cantilever bicycle brakes to sort of like, try and regulate it and, and keep it under control so yeah and, and I and I totally get that it's exhausting for other people around us and I think you do exactly the right thing because sometimes riding we just have to ride the waves of it we have to we have to do the hyper focus and then we have to move to the next thing and just you know that's that's how it is so there's not really a way of kind of I don't think there's a way of stopping it I think there's a way of just enjoying it and accepting sometimes who we are as individuals and our, our nuances and and ways. Um, not all of it is kind of positive when when it comes to that. You can get hyper focused on entirely the wrong things. And right. When you combine that with um, you know low self esteem, that's going to come from all this not being you know feeling not good enough. You end up you know you can really end up in some chaotic and catastrophic situations and and relationships and and all of that in in mm -hmm. your life. So it's um it's a very much a double edged sword when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Like you're maybe like going to become addicted in substance abuse, maybe? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. I did a talk recently um, at an event for um, ADHD and, and autism. And there was a lady there who was talking because she is very much involved in the youth offenders um, prison service in the UK. So she supports young offenders. She helps them when they get, you know, they get arrested for the first time and try to keep them out of prison again for the second time. She, One of the things she said in her talk was actually something like 90% of all the young offenders that are admitted, she believes have an ADHD diagnosis, but they're not they're not diagnosed. And because of this massive cocktail of hormones and everything that these young kids are coming from deprived areas, you know, they're really not, it is just they can't regulate themselves. They can't, you know, their impulsiveness is unregulated and they will just reoffend and reoffend because they just get into that cycle from that young age. And one of her big campaigns is to try and kind of stop that by uh, you know, getting these people diagnosed so they can have some kind of treatment or help or medication around that just while they're going through this like time in their life. So mm -hmm. it can be, you know, it can be really, really um, chaotic and 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 terrible um, for for people going through, you know, with this with not being diagnosed and not recognizing that actually what they feel is just their crappy behavior, or whatever is actually something that could be understood and managed a bit better. So. Mm. And so once you were diagnosed, what did that do for you and your understanding of yourself? Uh, did you enroll in programs? Or, or did you take any kind of medication? 
how, how do we, how do you move forward once you're diagnosed? So for me, understanding myself and, and getting that diagnosis, for, I thought I would just experience absolute relief. I thought I'd be so relieved. I'd be like, okay, that's brilliant. I know myself now. Kind of wasn't like that at all. Um, when when it came through, I think I had a very short window of, oh, I'm really relieved. It's That's great. But then came the kind of um, the grief of what could have been if I could have understood myself a little bit more in the past and hadn't basically given myself such a hard time over, you know, not being good enough or not feeling good enough. Um, there was a lot of sadness for a lot of choices that I made, perhaps when I was younger, when I got in with the wrong crowd and I, you know, was in followed terrible relationships and things because I was just not, I just didn't feel worthy of anything more. Um, there was this kind of anger that no one had, this kind of rage a little bit that no one had ever picked up on it before and just basically was just kind of telling me I wasn't good enough when actually there was something a little bit more, a little bit more nuance going on there. Um, so it was like this big roller coaster of emotions that probably I would say lasted for six months. I mean, and, and out the other side of it, I feel very much a lot more self-compassion for myself a lot more self-kindness I I mean I don't actually take any medication for it but I I know that if I wanted to explore that in the future it could I think medication would have helped me hugely when I was younger but I think I've I've learned so much so many coping strategies and so many ways of kind of managing myself and 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 this super high level of self-compassion now that actually I'm 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 kind of not medicating at the moment for it but mm. um but I know it can really hugely help other people as well. So, yeah, it was a real journey and an un unexpected one as well. I just wasn't expecting to turn to to just not feel this sudden surge. Just oh, brilliant! Now, now I know. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it was definitely a, a a mix of emotions after that diagnosis. Mm. So it sounds like the biggest takeaway is just understanding yourself better and putting the the, the pieces together. Like you were trying to solve a puzzle, but you're missing one critical piece and you're never going to be able to solve it. And so this awareness led to compassion and understanding. And I mean, that is a gigantic takeaway just to know that you're not broken, that you're okay. And this is how your brain is wired, right? Yeah, yeah. it's huge. And especially as a, if you're running a business, if you're someone who's a creative that's kind of, you know, there's so much stuff in all of that complexity, so much emotional stuff with running that comes with being self-employed, that comes with putting work out into the world. And to un when you kind of have a bit more self-compassion and you can understand that there is a bit of a, a difference in how your brain is, how your brain is kind of connected together and y you can find ways around it. It's not wrong. It's not broken. It's like, well, actually, I know that I am rubbish with timekeeping. I know that I can't, you know, some days I really can't focus at all. So it's how to, how can I mitigate that as much as possible, mitigate that that negative bit and actually find a way that works for me. Um, and that's that's then that's essentially what I help people do now with their own businesses, which is hugely rewarding. Um, and is yeah, but it just it's come from I guess my own kind of turmoil and and journey that's been kind of so up and down over the years. Okay, so you had said at the top that you're an ADHD coach for creatives. Is that did I remember yeah. that correctly? All right. So does that mean you're ADHD or you're helping people with their ADHD when you say I'm an ADHD yeah. coach? Both of those. I'm ADHD, <laughs> and also, <laughs> but it's about helping people. Can you guess? Um, it's about helping people manage their ADHD. So coping strategies, you know, for life, for business, for work. Um, I do. I'd also do a lot of work through some government organisations here in the UK that support neurodivergent people in the workplace and um, and in their businesses as well. So it's it's about finding ways of running, you know, the day to day bit of your business and not getting overwhelmed and not getting kind of, you know, really behind with deadlines, not burning out because that's a real that hyper focus burnout cycle for those of us with ADHD is a very real thing where we go all in for three months and then we have to spend three months basically not doing anything because we just literally burn every single bit of energy in our bodies. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's about how you manage or teaching people and, and supporting people in in managing that that you know that whole kind of mixing pot that comes with it all. So mm. yeah, but it's not not just business owners. There's a lot of people in in employment that need that support as well. And there's a lot of employers that also need to understand more about neurodivergence because um, although a lot of creatives have all these brain superpowers and these kind of neuro differences. I've, I've actually noticed in a lot of the clients that I work with that many of the agencies and creative agencies they work with 
I'm really, even though probably 50% of their staff are have, you know, some kind of ADHD or neurodivergence um, brain, they're so unneurodivergent friendly to work for. So yeah, it's a, it's a, there's an education piece going on and there's also a kind of, um, I guess, um, just, yeah, understanding and awareness piece as well. So, Wow. Um, I just have to be transparent and tell you how I'm processing all this because as okay, a person who practices intentional listening, interviewing you and just having a conversation with you, my brain is trying to keep up with your brain and it's way overclocked right now. I might have like more of that, uh, I don't know, Toyota motor and you're running at the Ferrari speed and the Toyota's just burning out, just trying to like <laughs> process. No, this is good. So it's exhausting for me. I just tell you right now, it is exhausting. Uh, <laughs> but, but is it exhausting for you to speak at this speed or to think at this speed? Or is this just normal gear for no. you? No. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm talking, I'm, just, I'm already two seconds in. Yeah. It's, um. no, this is how I speak. This is how I've always talked. Yeah. And I'm trying to be very conscious in slowing down how fast I'm Oh, talking. this is your slow speed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for keeping it slow for people like me. You know, the thing is, I've seen this happen before where you, you uh, sit in and you listen to a public speaker and they're able to tie together super complicated ideas and flow from thing to thing. My former business partner was like, like that, Jose Caballero. Uh, I've seen Gary Vaynerchuk speak and I was like, oh God, I just, I wish I could string together such complex ideas and words and facts and data points and switch gears when necessary. I just thought like, my brain just can't do that. And then later on you're like, oh my God, they have ADHD, duh. So. The first thing I want everybody to know is oftentimes ADHD, that label, at least in the past, has been looked at as something's wrong with your brain. But in fact, you have a super fast brain. You just process information faster than everyone else. And so you're going to be usually like really intelligent. And if you know how to apply it and to regulate it, you could be a top performing person in whatever industry that you're in, whether you're an employee yeah. or an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter. And so Jose used to say to me a lot and to everybody, he goes, my ADHD is too powerful. He learned to like lean into it and he created a lot of tools to help his brain organize what I would think is pretty normal stuff. But those tools given to a normal brain person or like a, what, what do we call it? It's not normal. What is the word that we describe the non-ADHD uh, brain? Neuroty they, they say neurotypical. neurotypical but okay, I like that. <laughs> the neurotypical brain looks at these tools like, wow, you just made something really, really easy. And, and that was how he tapped into his genius and he would develop all kinds of tools so that his brain can focus. And for neurotypical brains, it was brilliant. So there, there's an advantage here. Okay. Now, when we talk about that you're an ADHD coach for creatives, what kinds of patterns or things have you noticed that here's a challenge and here's a solution and here's how, let, let's try and help some people today. Okay. So the main thing is, um, there's, well, there's two things. First thing is focus and focusing on tasks when the initial joy and kind of dopamine has worn off. That is a real challenge um, for a lot of like my creative friends that I've spoken to and, and um, you know, people I've worked with is once that initial, you know, party bit of the project is, is done, it is very difficult to finish things. And I think the finishing things and the get and then to hit the deadlines because you're just in that like the last bit, even though you've got a tiny task to do, might take you as long as the whole rest of the project, um, is a real challenge for people. And that's one of the the things, the reasons why um, ADHDs get kind of not in trouble at work, but they might not be performing as, as, as good as they should be is because they're seen as being like, you know, we've done all this great work, but you just haven't emailed back that client or you haven't finish the project so that's a real a real a real kind of challenge um and to resolve that i mean there's always going to be a bit of this that you know a bit of that kind of procrastination on this last bit and that we're as adhd as we're kind of programmed to seek out the dopamine inducing part of, of what we're doing um but there's ways you, you, getting some accountability is absolutely key so if your employer or your you know or you at least or you have like somebody you're working with can offer you some accountability to just give you a little nudge on those tasks and just remind you of things and just kind of almost um there's a there's a concept called body doubling which is basically whereby you might jump on zoom we're both going to jump on zoom at 3 p.m 
and you're going to do the thing that you said you were going to do and I'm going to do something I need to do and then the task will get done. But that that concept of having that body done with someone in the room can, in the, even if it's a virtual room, can really help those final non-dopamine related tasks get done. And that applies to life stuff as well. You know, get, folding up your washing, tidying a kitchen, doing the washing up. You know, those are all really low dopamine tasks that as ADHDs we'll, we'll struggle with. So, mm. Okay, so body doubling and accountability. So let me ask you this yeah. question. So people have sometimes a challenge finishing tasks. And then if somebody can give them a gentle reminder, it's like, oh yeah, right, right. I need to finish that. Could you not just self-regulate? Could you not just set up alarms and uh, goals that are put on post-it notes or, or digitally so that you don't need someone else to do that for you? Of course you could do that. <laughs> um, <it's definitely, laughs> of course. But an ADHD is, is determined as a, um, an executive function disorder so or executive dysfunction. Executive function is goal-orientated action. So that is basically how you self-regulate, self, um, your self-awareness, your time management, all of those things to help you achieve some kind of goal. Because our executive function can be quite heavily um, in interesting or dysregulated or just kind of not quite as goal-orientated as other people, yes, we can certainly do all of those things, but probably chances are we'll think about doing it we won't do it and then we'll beat ourselves up because we rem we didn't remember to write the thing on the post-it note or we saw the alarm go off and we didn't do the thing and it just it just seems to be in my experience and and that kind of of the clients I've worked with that actually when you've got somebody a, a real human there to kind of whether that's virtually or in person or whatever to give you that accountability it, it helps to push your I guess you'll trust in yourself a little bit further as well so that some of the self-regulating activities might be feasible in the future. But yeah, it, the, the executing functioning side is a real killer when it comes to things like being on time as well, you know, doing the things you said you'd do, remembering to do the things that you have a post-it note in front of you right there, which I have some, um, to actually remember to do that. It's that still that that executive function thing. Mm, okay. Uh, this brings up a couple different things I want to share with you, like hearing this information and trying to map into things in my life and my timeline. I tend to somehow attract certain ADHD people into my life and they drive me crazy. But for whatever reason, we're like Abbott and Costello, uh, Bonnie and Clyde or whatever. We just belong together. It's kind of wild. And I was like, oh, can't you guys just get yourself done? Why are you working on this other stupid, crazy idea? And this, oh, you have a new idea today? Like like every single day? Come on. Right. And like, can can you not just finish? So let me let me take you back in time. This is now 2014. Uh, 2000, yeah, 2014, Jose and I are working together and he's teaching me things about core and the framework about brand strategy. And we decide to start a company together and he's the CEO and I'm just, uh, I don't know what I am. And so he likes to do things together and it would just annoy me. He's like, we're going to do a stand-up meeting. I'm like what? Stand-up meeting? Uh, I, I, I just, why are we having more meetings? And so he just liked to do things together and we got into an argument and I said, look, let's just try a test. Because he he believed in all these like Silicon Valley things like Agile, Scrum, all these tools to help move software. And we weren't developing software, so it just really confused me. And he just looked at me like I'm a knuckle-dragging Cro-Magnon Neanderthal or whatever it is, right? Just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm stuck in this kind of waterfall project management where it's very hierarchical and he wanted to do things very flat. So here's the challenge I gave to him. He said, why don't we try your way and see what happens? Let's do it for a week and see how much we accomplish. And then we'll we'll measure against the baseline of how much I can get yeah. done. So she's like, sure, let's do it. So he gathered a team. He was like, what's our global business objective? What are you going to do? So he's like assigning tasks. We're all doing it together. And all my tasks I did in one day, actually in hours. Yep. So I've done everything I need to do for the entire week. And I just waited. And then at the end of the week with all the meetings, no one finished anything. I know you're feeling this, right? And I was like, yeah. okay, we have a problem, Jose. We cannot run projects like this because nothing is done. He's like, well, this was just a bad week. I'm like, ah, no, I believe you know how to run these things, but this is how nothing gets done. But having heard you say this about body doubling and having other people keep us accountable because the executive function of prioritizing goals is in dysfunction 
And so everything yeah. looks important and everyone's easily distracted. And if they're following the lead of someone who's ADHD, who's yet not yet figured this part out, it's a cluster F. I could quite literally say I could have done everybody's work in one day and then you all could just go home. Like, what's the point? Okay, please That'd respond. Yes. Yeah, I want your insight, uh, any kind of uh, jokes you want to throw at both of us. It's all good. What you've just described there is absolutely typical on Jose's part, typical ADHD like behavior. Getting everything together, planning it all out, scheduling it in, listing the task, but not actually doing any of it. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly that. <laughs> I wish I knew that two years prior Honestly, to like, going to business. we can spend hours. And I, I, this is the challenge I have yeah. with some of my clients is they will be like, I've done this amazing plan and I've done this and I'm going to follow this up and everything else. But actually, part of helping them to feel confident in their decision making and their ability to run a business or their ability to do their job is to kind of um, give them that a little bit of self-trust. And you do have to. You do have to say, well, actually, as part of this, let's get some of this done now. When are you going to do this? If And if you're not going to do it now, let's get it on your actual calendar and let's, I'm going to message you that day or I'm going to, we can, you know, and so you, there is actually some action taken because the plan is great, but the plan needs to move, like you say, with the, the needle has to move in some direction and some of those tasks need to get done. Um, so yeah, I recognize that hugely, honestly, that I've been there myself <laughs> at the high day. <laughs> You've been Jose before. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. Is, is, it, is it correct for me to come to the conclusion that if you're a neurodivergent ADHD person, you, you actually get a lot of joy in the planning of just getting people together and managing that. Like you're a classic planner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if that was your job, you would be excellent at it. If that was my job, I would be excellent at it, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I have, I have that was obviously part of my job that I used to do before, and that bit I could do all day long. But it's um, not all jobs are just planning. There is always action that has to be. <laughs> you don't say. It's not, you can't just sit there and make a plan for something because there's parts of that you will have to do. And, and that could even be sending emails to people or doing, you know, and those things won't get done if you haven't got the right kind of, I guess, tools and and ways of sort of realizing and, and that self-awareness so yeah. yeah well i'm all about yeah, leaning into your strengths so if your skill is to plan and bring people together and organize <laughs> and map things out hire an assistant and say okay i need you to like turn this in and drill this into deliverables and and to yeah. email everybody out and then to hold everyone accountable and then you can get paid to organize things and and i think that's a yeah. very necessary job within an organization now here's where my uh, neurotypical brain was like rubbing against the system because I'm like, my God, I could have just told everybody what to do. We don't have to have a meeting about it. Here's all your marching orders and you just trust that I'm the architect of all of this and you all get your work done in a day and we'll have pizza for Tuesday through Thursday or Friday and then we'll celebrate at the end. But he and I were just butting heads because he's just like, no, you don't understand how things need to be done. And you know what? He even did something even <laughs> crazier. Here's the crazier part. I'm like, this isn't working. He goes, you know what? We need to have um, like a, a board of directors. I'm like, what? You want to formalize having more meetings? This is just driving me crazy. What? What? Why do we need that? Uh, Chris, we need a business plan. I'm like, we have a business plan. It ain't working. We're going broke right now. And we don't have time to sit around and have a board of advisors or directors telling us more stuff that we could be doing and not doing anything. So I'd love for you to respond to that. Because... The way that um, ADHD brains work as well, we have a lot of ideas. So the ideas flow, but there's not necessarily the um, the kind of, um, I guess it's like this impulsive impulsiveness where the ideas just keep coming. We have to, imp you know, we want to do something with it. So we kind of create all these ideas and plans. And actually, it's it really difficult for us to see and, and emote, like with the executive function to really see that actually the goal at the end of it isn't just to have a bunch of advisors or a bunch of board people. It's to have the thing out in the world, whatever that pro product is or that service and make the money. And um, so that's, again, it's just this kind of, it's this unregulated flow of ideas and, and planning and, but without a kind of task or in goal orientated kind of end to it. And that's really typical of ADHD. And we don't, the thing is, as ADHD is, we don't always realize that that's what we're doing um, because we're just, we're just the, you know, the, it can be the ideas people. And that's why in the creative industry as well, we thrive. In, in the majority, you know, in advertising, in marketing, we can really, really thrive in some of those creative roles, but we can also really, really flounder 
because we don't have the executive function a lot of the time to actually, you know, f- take that board of winning. Why, why are we having this board of advisors when we have this other list of tasks that we haven't done? So we don't have the executive function to actually go from the idea to the actual finished thing that's out in the world. Um, and there's just more ideas, just take the place, more kind of dopamine, right? The, the, you know, the board of directors, that's going to be exciting. So let's, let's get them and let's just do that. So it's this dopamine seeking as well. Okay. Unregulated dopamine seeking. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd like to explore the whole advertising as potentially a great fit for a ADHD brain in a little bit. Yeah. But I got to ask you this question. As an ADHD person, do you find it difficult to be silent? Do you find it difficult just to listen versus I need to talk and tell you all my things right now? Um, yes. <laughs> That's a really like. I saw you thinking about it. Like, should I tell the truth or not the truth right now? All right, tell me the pause. Tell me everything that's happening inside your brain. Okay, so yes, I I do find it very difficult sometimes not to talk over people, and I, and it's something I'm working on very you know all the time, and it's um it's it's an ongoing challenge because when things pop into your head, this is the impulsivity, it's this un- inability to be able to almost regulate your yourself and your kind of uh, your what you're doing and things it's um so yeah I, I do find it really really hard to to not tell everybody all the things um in one sentence without breathing in one go um and imagine when you get a bunch of ADHDs together it's just it's either amazing if you're another ADHD or not so amazing if you're somebody who's just sitting kind of you know quietly in the corner well, I've been that quiet person in the corner many a time. They're like, okay, I don't even need to be here right now. No one even cares what I have to say. But if you were in a room with four uh, ADHD brains and you're at the dinner table and no one wants to listen, everyone wants to talk, who's listening to anybody or is it just joyful just to hear yourself speak? I think it's. I think there is a, definitely a sense of joy in meeting people that you suddenly feel like you don't you know you're you don't you fit in with you know you've you've kind of if most of us if we're neurodivergent have spent a good portion of our lives not feeling you know not feeling seen or not feeling like we can be ourselves because people are like you know aren't they gonna shut up or my god it's you know just you know so there's there's always that sense of not you know having to dampen yourself a little bit so I think there's a lot of joy in just expressing yourself in in a way that kind of feels natural and and is it there's no one judging you um but my experience of being at a dinner table with other ADHD is, is we do listen we do you know and but we kind of it's okay we bounce around on each other and some of the most hilarious conversations are with other people that have that quick mind and um you know the creative ideas flowing and everything else so yeah I think there's there's a bit of both there there's the joy but there I think there is listening but we don't need a lot of time to listen we just need split seconds to put this in. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I will I will not um, challenge you on that. Like when you say I don't need a lot of time to listen, it's like you're really not listening then, are you? But that's okay. Because I, I look at it when, and I, I think now I'm starting to suspect maybe my wife is the ADHD because I'll hear her talk for 20 minutes straight. And then when she pauses, and I, I like I think she's done, I'll, I'll start one sentence and she'll start going again and, and I'll wait. And then it happens all the time. And then eventually I'm like, can I finish one thought? And and it's like, I haven't even finished. Like, you know how sometimes you set up the first half of the argument or the idea and the second half changes how the first half is presented. But she chops me right there and like, well, let me tell you about this. I'm like, I, I didn't finish my thought, honey. Can I finish a thought? Because I'm really good at just sitting there listening and being quiet for as long as necessary because it's important for me, just as uh, how I align myself to make sure the other person can completely express whatever idea they have. And for me to be able to listen with as much of my uh, brain as possible. And so when I'm in a room full of ADHD people, like they don't really care what I have to say because I can't even get a word in. And so this is fascinating to me. So you're like, eh, we don't have to spend a lot of time listening. So the question is, are you really listening? Are you really learning about each other? Or it's just really like you're hearing yourself and you're feeling accepted and you don't have to feel judged or... Uh, you have to dampen yourself. I 100% believe that we are, as ADHD is, that super quick brain of ours is has a, an, an an insane ability to be able to 
in to kind of understand other people very quite quickly. We can we can we can almost use that superpower to, I don't know, get kind of understand who they are very fast without actually having to sit and listen to a lot a lot. It's more about the body language. We just pick up on all those things, honestly. <laughs> okay, let me say so. Like a magic power then, yeah. <laughs> You can learn about people without even telling you what they would think. That's, this is what you're saying. You're like psychic. No, not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Clearly. Close. <laughs> I just think we're, yeah, we're, we're very fast at being able to pick up on lots of cues <laughs> from people and and things like that, I think. Okay. All right. So I'll give you an example here where I'm going to challenge that a little bit. So I, right. I'm at a, an event in Portland. This is many years ago. And we just finished speaking, Jose, myself, and another speaker. I could just tell there's another super fast brain. I was just impressed with her intelligence. We sat at a table at a bar and they were just like talking. And then they would ask me something and I was just barely able to express it. And then they're doing their thing again, right? And I was starting to get annoyed and I'm starting to feel really disconnected. And if they were super like hyper intelligent, ADHD brain, they would have noticed this and they would have regulated themselves or maybe through their ADHD brain, they can't do that because it all feels the same to them. I had to literally say, um, guys, I enjoy this conversation, but I don't feel like I'm contributing anything here and I'm exhausted and I'd like to speak, but if you don't, if you guys want to do your thing, I don't want to be a wet blanket to your party. And they both looked at me like that was a news flash, and they stopped. They actually stopped and could contain themselves for long enough for me to feel like I can be a part of the conversation. So this is my challenge to you, Abby, which is you say you could read me, but I don't know if you can, especially in that example. What do you think? And um, I, I, what I think in that, that's, that's quite, that's a really astute observation actually for it. And I think we do get this dysregulation, this inability to kind of sort of be, stop being impulsive and, and all of that is, is very real, especially when there's somebody else there that is on your kind of frequency. Um, and sometimes it does. If, and the, the thing is with ADHD, if somebody turns around and says, hang on a minute, you're not including me, you know, I don't feel included, I don't feel in it. And um, there's something called rejection sensitive dysphoria that a lot of people with neurodivergence and ADHD have. Um, rejection sensitive dysphoria is basically this hugely um, it, it feeling emotions at a very, very high and acute level. Um, so it's the same as like body dysmorphia or something. You have this um, weird like sense of everything. And, you know, somebody doesn't like you. They absolutely hate you. Or, you know, you've done something hugely wrong. And and actually for someone to turn around and say, I guarantee that those two people who you said probably felt absolutely terrible inside. They were like, because they just wouldn't have realized. I'm going to put my hand up and say, I, I expect they were probably absolutely mortified to to not to realize that you had been feeling like that in that conversation, which is why when you get that kind of wake up as well, you don't want to be like that. You don't want to kind of alienate people or push them away. So it's, um, yeah, they probably went home that night going, I talk too much. I talk too fast. <laughs> but they stopped right then and there. And I was able to engage yeah. and have real conversations. And there was a back and forth. They just needed to know that they need to switch into a different gear uh, because I think they saw each other and they were just so happy to just talk at lightning speeds. I, I, like I, I still question because they say like when you're talking, you're not learning. When we hold silence or space for other people, then we can actually learn about them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's my superpower that I'm okay to just be quiet mm -hmm. most of the time. Okay, so I, I get that part. Now let's let's switch gears here. I would love for you to give us maybe a couple of tips. I would just want to prime you here. Uh, you don't have to do this second. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to have a couple of tips. Like say three things that you can do. If you suspect that you're an ADHD or you know for a fact an ADHD brain, a neurodivergent brain, what you can do to be more productive or to create space for other people or how you can read those physical cues that your brain may not be picking up. So I just want you to think about that for a second. Now, I promise because I don't want to have an open loop and not finish it. There tends to be ADHD people in the creative direction space uh, within agencies or at higher levels. So if you can get to the higher levels, you can do really well because you'll come up with ideas and your team will then do it. Uh, people who are really good at single tasking things. So mm. how, how have you seen people excel in especially advertising agencies and that creative director role? The first tip that I can give you to be really, to, to really prime that neurodivergent mind is to look after yourself physically. 
a lot of the creative industry work long hours and they they drink you know they take their clients out and there's in my experience there's a lot of kind of this um there's there's a lot of you know maybe to be too busy for lunch and all this kind of stuff. The best thing and the biggest thing you can do as an ADHD to maintain and and main, you know keep your brain working is to look after yourself physically. Drink loads of water. Eat. Make sure you eat lunch every day or or for, you know you have something that you eat. Stay off as you know try and lay off the sugar if possible because sugar is again something that will exacerbate your dopamine and it's it means you start looking for more of it. Um. You know, try and try and stay fit. Get outside. Move your body. Moving your body is the other thing you can do, which is, you know, absolutely. I think, in my mind, crucial to maintaining a, a really productive and powerful and regulated ADHD brain. So th- that is really the 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 kind of crux of really regulating and keep staying as regulated as possible and staying as um, aware of your surroundings as possible. The second thing I would think um, is really going to be, I think, practicing some kind of, um, whether that's a pause before you speak, taking, you know, the, the, it's that self-awareness thing. So taking a breath before you speak, um, understanding yourself and really kind of um, taking the time to do that. So whether you educate yourself on ADHD, if you're if you're diagnosed or not diagnosed, whether you find other people that you can talk to about ADHD, whether you listen to podcasts about it, but just having that self-awareness so that you're aware enough to, you know, before you go into a meeting, maybe you take a breath, maybe you go and walk around the block, maybe you um, have developed your self-awareness to the point where you understand that you do need to breathe sometimes and, and you know, sort of let, take in more of those physical and sort of emotional cues from other people as well. And the last one, I would say, really, developing a set of way of keeping track of what you're doing day to day, which isn't necessarily like a productivity schedule, but it's a way of not necessarily a to-do list either. It's how you learning how to prioritize, learning how to actually not let the tiny little non-dopamine tasks drop off your radar. Um, and that could be as simple as blocking stuff into your Google Calendar, getting a coach, getting someone to hold you accountable, getting a colleague or your manager to, or, or somebody, you know, that to kind of check in with you and just just make sure that you're not letting things slide and you're actually keeping on top of stuff. So, and not everything, there's no like magic ADHD app that's going to transform your life and suddenly make everything really productive and really kind of work really smoothly. So it's about trying different things. So and and seeing whether they work for you, you know, to do lists are great, but that's not, you know, having post it notes like you say can work sometimes for some things. Putting them up on a whiteboard in front of you, um, you know, finding ways of not letting things disappear because I think with ADHD, if there's a task and you or there's something that isn't in your suddenly in your immediate kind of sphere of vision, there's a thing called object impermanence, which means it doesn't exist. So if there's a task that you know you've got to do, but you've kind of buried it somewhere. And you, you know you haven't looked at it for a week or anything else. That 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 task essentially doesn't exist. So it's really trialing and finding ways that work for you that so that you don't let that happen because that's when overwhelm can kick in and everything else. Great. So let me just quickly recap. Number one is you got to take care of your health, and and this is kind of interesting because the the few uh, ADHD people I know and associate with, they're not exactly in great shape. And I see that you work out regularly. I've seen many of your posts. I don't want to tell people how you keep in shape, but back in the day, you were doing certain things and you're very fit, super fit, right? Number two, and I've seen you do this throughout our entire conversation is you'll take a breath before you speak. And I'm assuming in what what feels like half a second to me in your hyper fast brain, like you're the flash, you know, you're whoosh, you just sorted through the ideas like, do I want to say this? And you're probably editing a whole bunch of things. And just a little bit of a pause before you speak makes a big difference. Number three is you say like whatever works for you, but you need to somehow track your progress just to make sure you're on task and you're doing the right things for what it is that you want, however you want to do that. Now, here's the beautiful part of what you just said. I would tell someone who is a neurotypical to do the exact same thing. Literally do the exact same thing for different reasons, but do the exact same things. Number one, uh, watch what you eat. Uh, take care of your body because you're going to be working for a long time. And if you don't take care of the machine, the machine will fall apart. If you take care of the machine, you have more energy, you have greater focus. And you know what? 
what what you say to the world is, I'm a motivated, focused person who can get things done. We just assume that about people who are in really good shape, right? And you'll look better and you'll feel better. Um, number two, I'd go a little bit more extreme. Instead of pausing before you speak, don't speak at all if what you say doesn't improve upon silence. I'll just put it out there. It's not necessary for you to speak. You can just sit there in silence and process and people will give you credit for being a deep thinker, even if you're not thinking about anything. And then the last one is, of course, we have to have pretty clear goals and we need to make sure the goalpost is clear to us so that we can take steps towards achieving that. Anybody who's been successful knows what they want. They've envisioned it in their mind and they're able to break it down into subtasks to chunk it down and then to go at it one step at a time. And that's really critical. And one of the things that we like to tell people is focus. Focus is an acronym for follow one course until success. Because this is where some of my friends get into a lot of trouble who are in the neurodivergent spectrum there, where they have a beautiful business model. They have tons of experience that they can do wonderful things. And then every other day, it seems like they're calling me or messaging me. It's like, oh, I want to do this now. I'm like, what happened to that brilliant business model that I think is excellent that you were making money on and you want to quit that because it was so successful. I do not understand this and you don't have the resources to try every single thing. And so I have to constantly remind them like, is this in alignment with your first goal? Because until you're super successful there, do you want to change? And you know, just asking that question will make them stop, pause, say, no, you're right. I do want that thing. That is important to me. And so then they're able to do that. Okay. There's a couple other things I want to share with people having just hung around with enough neurodivergent uh, people with ADHD. They develop very strong systems to regulate their brain and to help them prioritize. Because they shared an article with me. He's like, he's like, I can't communicate this to you, but here's what it's like to have ADHD. And he slides it over. And I read the article and it's fascinating. And the, and the, the writer of the article described being in a room where every single thing is equally important as everything else. Make a million dollars. That's very important. Somebody walking by, that's really important. There's a fly in this room. That's equally important. And they can't regulate that. So once he shared that article with me, I'm like, dude, I totally understand you. And it explains a lot of our relationship right now, right? But here's a really cool thing. And I thought he did this for theatrics, but he had to do this to just make sure that uh, when he's not on medicine, um, that he can focus. He literally did this. He would wear headphones and that, that would put him into a, I guess, sensory deprivation state. And the headphones would play like really fast metal and very loud, like I can hear just walking by because he doesn't want to hear anything else but this music, which puts him into a, like a focus zone. And then he quite literally did this. He took post-it notes and taped them on the side of his glasses. So he was blocking his vision. He literally, did, I thought it was uh, for show, but he needed yes. this. Yes. And he would just look forward and then he had an alarm set every 15 minutes to remind him these are the three things you have to do today. Because he, he gets started, he forgot what he's supposed to be doing. It, and it would just bug me because I'm like, oh my God, it was just so loud. And he's like, okay, you're supposed to finish this thing. Okay, he's working and an alarm would ring. Okay. And he developed core as a way to regulate his own brain. So he'd always start with, here's everything we want to do. Then we have to prioritize, prioritize, prioritize until here's the thing we must do today. And he would have that in writing in front of him, the alarm set, and that's how he kept focus. And in that way, when he did all those things, he actually got stuff done. It was in, extremely impressive at that point. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and I, I think if that that works for him, and I think that it might work for other people as well. And I think, uh, but then some some ADHD, some neurodivergence are very highly sensitive to noise. So actually, I'm one that will actually put my headphones on with no sound and that but it's still providing that sensory deprivation but if there's noise that's gonna I need the silence and, and lots of other people are the same so it's finding you know do you work best with noise with dance music with meth you know with nothing how do you make that work but I'd love the idea of putting the blinkers on and um, you know and, and some people don't like to have the alarms but they like to work in slightly longer blocks it is such a trial and error process of finding stuff that works for you but as Jose has found when you find that key, you know, that magic formula that works for you, super productive and get like eight, you know, a week's work done in one day. It's, it's, it's amazing. But that's that there are lots of different tips and tricks to use and lots of ways of doing it. And once you find your magic, magic, magic way or magic formula for you, then yeah, absolutely brilliant. Mm. And I found that uh, this is not a, a, like a blanket statement, but I found that the people 
that I know that I have ADHD and I can tell their ability to learn to read is on next level. Their ability to recall things that they've read. I've been very envious of. I'm like, God, I wish I could do that. You just chewed up that book in a minute. And and now you're like reciting from it as if you wrote the book. Incredible. Like you're dropping terms. I have to jot them all down because they're not terms I'm familiar with, like rejection sensitive dysphoria. And you talked about the executive function and body doubling and just dropping. Them. So you can remember things. Obviously, you're higher hyper intelligent here. For my little brain, I've got to write down words like 10 times and look at them before I, it sticks with me. So there's something beautiful about how different our brains work. The rest of it, I do not envy, but that I do envy for sure. So if you were like an academic- my keys or anything like that. But yeah. <laughs> Just like my wife, by the way. I can remember the words. She can never find her phone. It's like the daily mystery, like four times in the day. It's like, has anybody seen my phone? And everybody, my, my boys, yeah. we all roll our eyes. Like, we don't know, mom. It's like, where did you put it last? We just have no idea. Do you know, it's the one thing I use my Apple Watch for more than anything else is pressing the button so that I, so my phone beeps and I know where it is in the house because and I don't use it for anything else, but it's magic for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can get a lanyard attached to your phone and that way it's like attached to your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Just tie it onto me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was just saying like, maybe if you're a teacher, if you're in the academic space, this could be really good for you because you can learn really fast uh, and you can retain what you read and then you can teach other people what you've read. And then you can also read them without having to listen to them and understand that they're confused in areas and you could redirect, right? I also yeah. talked to Rob Fitzpatrick. He wrote the book, The Workshop Survival Guide. And when I was interviewing him, his brain was going just like a gazillion hours a second. And, and I'm just, I can't keep up. So eventually I'm like, Rob, I hope you don't find this offensive, but by any chance are you ADHD? He goes, yes, can you tell? And he just kept talking. It didn't even, he didn't even stop. And this was fantastic. He goes, Chris, I'll try to go slower. He didn't, but it was fine. Because, you know, we can listen to a podcast over and over again and we could pull the pieces out. Again, what's really interesting with Rob is he designs workshops to work around his brain because he needs to be doing stuff. So he's like, it turns out, the more you switch tasks or games with people in a workshop, the more they're engaged. So if you talk for a really long time, or if you give them a task to design a website for three hours, their brain is just going down and down and down. But if you give them like rapid fire, 30 seconds, do this, two minutes, do that, one minute, do this. They're like, oh, I, I just got to keep up here. Uh, so that is a person working with the tools that they have in their brain and making the most of it and then becoming brilliant at teaching other people these skills. Yeah. I, and do you know what? I love doing that. And that's why I love speaking. It's why I love running live workshops and events is because exactly that. I love, I love the kind of, you don't really know what's coming and you don't really know. So you, you can just kind of, um, yeah, really kind of roll with it and, and keep things fast moving. So yeah, I will, I will have to look up his episode because that sounds awesome. Yes. I, I think it just dropped this week and it's just worth every second that you can listen to it. And I'm sure you're, you're going to hear it and you're like, oh, I see you. I see, brother. I, I totally get what yeah. you're going through. My friend. Yes. And then you're probably thinking, oh, poor Chris. <laughs> you have some sympathy. It's like for the ADHD me. series of guests. I think so, maybe. <laughs> like I said, I somehow attract all these people to me. So uh, I, I've not learned to, uh, to work with them, you know? I'm married to one, I believe. I, we won't know for sure, but I, I suspect. Uh, anyways, Abby, is there anything else that you're doing that you want to tell people about? Um, no, um, well, at the moment, I'm going to be launching my own podcast in a couple of weeks, um, I'm, which is going to be really good. I've done one episode um, and I'm going to do a couple more. I've just it's done the ADHD thing of, of not um, not doing like more than one in one go. Um, but yeah, if people want to reach out to me, if you want to know more about ADHD or how, um, you know, how you can sort of learn to manage it a little bit, um, you can come and have a look at my website um, or check me out on Instagram. And with a name like Abby Lemon, you just have to type it in and you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious with your podcast that you're launching. Yeah. And do you have guests? I will have guests, yeah. <laughs> or will you just... Do you want to come and talk about ADHD? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like, how does an ADHD host have guests because they want to do all the talking? Um. I think, I don't know yet because I haven't recorded any of them, but we'll find out, won't we, when we, uh, <laughs> we'll find out when I interview some people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could probably do a brilliant podcast as a series of hero thoughts on whatever, and it's just you. And I enjoy those podcasts mm -hmm. as well. 
my initial thoughts around doing it were to do it on kind of the meaning of happiness as well and finding happiness in your work and as an ADHD where you find that joy from um because of my master's research that I'm doing into positive psychology so it kind of um that's that was another that was another tangent that I was considering going off down with my with my podcast as well as just doing a series of me basically talking about stuff like that so and how many episodes do you plan on doing um unlimited i don't know i'll probably do a first season of let's say yeah just unlimited me talking um probably a first season of about maybe six episodes to start with and see how see how i get on with that so. okay that's a reasonable goal and something that uh neurodivergent brain could probably take on and do right yeah okay beautiful well it's a real pleasure talking to you uh, and it's been a long time since you and i have chatted and i just i enjoyed my time talking to you and thanks for sharing a little bit about how you process the world and how what you do can help a lot of other people who are going through similar things and maybe have mis been misunderstood and misunderstand themselves. The one thing that uh, the big takeaway for me, regardless if you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, is to to treat yourself with a little self-compassion. And, and I think there are so many people around us that are going to tell us there's something wrong with us, whether there is or not. And it's very hard to overcome those voices. And so we have to begin with the healing process for ourselves, learn to love ourselves a little bit more, to be more compassionate and try to understand who we are as a unique individual, not meant to fit into some kind of mold. And if you could do that, I think you can achieve everything that you want in your life. And with that, Abby Lemon, thank you very much for being our guest today. It's been absolutely wonderful to be here. Thank you.